He's Black Guy Fox, and I'm trying to come up with a joke on the spot and failing miserably. And together, we are Fox and Friends. Today, the third and fourth friends joining us today to talk about creativity and social justice are Mike Miller and Matt Davis from Endless Mike and the Beagle Club. One, two, three. I'm flying solo on introduction duties today as Black Guy Fox is preparing for his spring tour, which kicks off May 10th at the Deep End in Frostburg, Maryland, then heads to dates in Montreal May 16th through 19th for Pooza Fest and related shows, some dates that haven't been officially announced yet, and I'm not going to be the one to break that embargo, and then Nashville, Tennessee on June 1st for Jorts Fest, July 7th in Gilbert, Pennsylvania for Camp Punksylvania, and back to Dig Deep Brewing Company in Cumberland, Maryland on July 13th for the annual Fox and Friends Festival. But while he figures out what underwear fits in his carry-on and researches the best place to get poutine in Montreal, I get to introduce our talk with Mike Miller and Matt Davis from Endless Mike and the Beagle Club. Mike Miller, Davis, thanks for being part of Fox and Friends. How you guys doing today? Yeah, I'm doing well. So, so I do want to take, take a minute and just talk about how both you and I met. I think our first time meeting was, was at Mr. Smalls, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, it was the show that Robbie Lester set up. Is that right? No, that, that, was, that was when I was on tour. No, no, that like cover show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he set that up. He set them both up. But they were both at Mr. S oh, no, yeah, you're right. First time we met was at Mr. Smalls. When you were touring, and yeah, we played with Nathan Gray. That's when you hopped on that show. That, that's when I first heard you play. Then okay. shortly after that, oh, that's when Robbie connect, um, got me onto the uh, Impact 90 show where you just played all Weezer. That yeah. was just way, way too much fun. Wait, yeah. Did everybody play Weezer or? Uh, no, no. It was like everybody, it was all cover sets though. Ian was Green Day and I did all Weezer. And I think. Like our buddy Justin's band was rancid, the acoustic rancid, you know, and uh, there was somebody else, an Everclear or something, right? Yeah. Somebody did Lannis Morrison. She was pretty. That sounds like a fun show. Yeah, it was cool. The Everclear guy was cool too. He played Strawberry. That's the song I liked by them. So that was cool. I low-key think Everclear is genuinely underrated. Oh, yeah? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was listed that much ever clear so I can't, I can't even comment on that but I, I do remember you gave me two copies of your, of your well both cds the husky tenor which we'll talk about here in a little bit and also alongside saint paul which i think is still one of my favorite records of all time it's so fucking good man <laughs> and i i do i do want to know what is your process when it comes to writing songs like how, how's everything start out well i'll address the first part of it and davis he could talk about the second and that is that uh, i usually have the uh this you know the song just like how you would have heard it at mr smalls when i'm playing by myself just me and the guitar or me and the piano whatever instrument it's like. that's it's and that's always different sometimes it's the music first sometimes they come up with an idea for words and then build the music around it but that part's always different I'll say that it usually goes from start to finish. Like I'll write the first line, come up with the first line first and just write until it feels done. So that's why, you know, there's no choruses and they get to be too long. And I say, well, like there's nothing I can cut. I need to say it all. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's how it works. And then it's uh, off to the Beagle Club. How's that part work, Davis? So we usually get together in a room and there's usually multiple songs to to pick from and we just kind of work on an arrangement together so just kind of start playing it sometimes it sometimes it's real fast and easy like just to sometimes it just kind of comes together and so other times we really work through it 
and try to figure out, okay, you know, like it's just, it's just, uh, coming up with an arrangement, but usually the song is pretty, pretty done before it gets to that part. You know, it's just a matter of arranging it, but uh, I was, all of the songs work really well with just my, so it's just, it's just trying to find stuff that's fun to play with it and, and making each one sound you sound unique from each other. Yeah. There's not a whole lot of change to the structure of the song itself. It'll pretty much sound like it sounds like the song itself will be as long as it is what it's me on a guitar or whatever, you know, the same chords, the same. And a lot of that kind of stuff is already implied, right? Like the starts and stops and the yeah. dynamics of it. But then other ones will be like, let's just take this one apart. Let's see what happens with it, you know? Because we've always played like with a bunch of different, me and Davis have done this the whole time that it's been a thing, basically. That's true of Cody as well and Matt. Other people have been sort of there for different writing sessions and then they're not at the next one or, you know, it kind of swims in and out and comes and goes. John Thorell has been very involved since the Husky Tether times, you know, but other people come and gone. And I think even... Even then, just putting songs together, it's like whoever wants it the most, that's the way it goes. You know, if there's a disagreement, like, okay, you really seem to care about this, then have at it, man. Now let's do it your way. You know, but they, that doesn't really happen, does it? To where we like fight about it. We'll argue and gripe at each other about other things during it. <laughs> when it comes to the actual choices in the songs, we're usually pretty excited to hear each other's ideas. If somebody has an idea, we're excited to do it. <laughs> so as somebody who's not a musician, when you talk about arranging based off the original solo version of the song, how is arranging and adding in the other in instruments different than maybe just coming up with something from scratch? So you already have the, the structure of the song. You already have the basic chords and, and the different parts and all the words when you're, when you're starting with it. But then, it could go a lot of different ways. And a lot of times it's, you know, uh, like if, if I just hear Mike playing, I kind of know a lot of times where he's going and, and, and what he wants with it. But, you know, sometimes I'm wrong, but usually I can, I can guess. Uh, but it's just, you know, it's just deciding, you know, does this, does this song need a piano? Does it need three guitars? You know, it's just, you they're all they're all different and it's kind of fun you know we have a lot of instruments around that we can kind of you know and a lot of people that will play multiple things so especially john john and matt like really play a lot of stuff and if matt matt's great enough on the guitar that if he wanted to just play guitar he would kill but you know he's He'd rather play all kinds of weird stuff. So it's awesome. Yeah. John's a classically trained cellist, but would, you know, can play, but plays guitar and plays this, have everything else too. He wants to banjo and whatever they want to teach themselves to do. But I mean, you know, even Davis is being too modest there. He's the drummer most of the, mostly, but he's a better piano player than I am. He can play the guitar and Cody plays bass, but he also plays the bell. He's a very serious bells player. Isn't he, David? Yeah, he Glock is. and Spiel player. He's taking it yeah. seriously. It's a, it's a craft to him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he's a drummer too, you know? So like everybody can switch in it. You're also a lot better at playing your piano parts than I am. Like, yeah, like, if, like if you write something, like you're, you always play it better. Like I can, I can do what I do, but uh, yeah, I don't know. You have a hard time slumming just, it to my level of ability. <laughs> I can't play a, this poorly. Not, not at all what I mean. <laughs> do you write your songs with the intention of them being solo songs or do you or 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 full band songs or do you, do you just take them and just see what happens with them? Um all no, always with the intention of a full band. And then sometimes it'll be like, you know, this actually doesn't need a full band. But it always when when you're starting, the the idea is to have a band. Yeah. Yeah, everything's better with a band. Everything's better with your friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no doubt about that at all. And that, that be said, I, I never asked you this and I always kind of wondered where did the Beagle Club come from? Like the, like the name of the whole project. Oh, our buddy Joe lived on Beagle Club Road back in Johnstown. We would 
hang out at the Beagle Club. It's a thing. A Beagle Club is like a hunting club. You know, you in Indiana, Pennsylvania and uh, Appalachia, you guys know about this. Beagle Clubs, right? It's like a hunting thing. So there was an actual Beagle Club, the South Fork Beagle Club, Sportsman's Club, Beagle Club or something. And it was at the end of his road and his road was Beagle Club Road. And we spent a whole summer there just like we'd walk down there at night and sit around and I don't know, listen to music in his house, walking down there. And then this is where we started this band. That's where, where we made the first record, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first record was Husky Tender Layer, was the one before that. No, the first one's called Pieces of String Too Small to Use. And that was the one that was done there. I do want to talk about, talk about Husky, Husky Tender as well, because you guys just released all oh, River Lease on C10 Records, right? Yeah, that's right. It just came on all in October. And I, I saw the promo you did asking, asking your friends or having people just talk about what, what that record means to them. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Like, like listening to people connected with that even after long after it came out. Yeah, it was so nice. It was wild, you know? It was wonderful. Um, that was our friend Derek's idea. He was like, that's how you should do it. You know, that's what the... just He said, I'll make a video and then we'll just ask other people too. I'll ask other people as well. I mean, who wants to... Hey, send me a video about how awesome you think I am. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, that's exactly what I did. And uh, that that's what we got back. And yeah, it was really nice. It was really cool. It was really, really cool. We got a few other ones too from, I was like, you can send anybody else wants them to send them in. And, and they did. And they were, they were even nicer, you know. We'll do something with that eventually with those ones too. Was there anyone you were surprised to hear from that spoke out about it? Everyone. Everyone that sent me in, I was surprised to hear about. It. They weren't like friends of ours or anything. Not all of them were, you know. It's people that like it. It was cool. And Davis, you did the remastering, right? I, it's actually, I remixed it. Mm -hmm. So basically, I, I started it, I took it back to scratch, like just from, from all the tracks and, and recreated it. So I did that because back, in, back whenever we made the original one, I was really bad about saving things. And I didn't save a copy of the mix before it went to master and whenever it was master for CD, it was the early two thousands and it was not, there were just a lot of things that happened to it that you would never do to music that's intended for vinyl. Like it was sort of like when all music was supposed to be really loud and it, the, the person that worked on it was a being it against American idiot. So not that those albums sounded all the same, but that's, that's like, he was trying to compress it and get it as loud as that on CD. So I just didn't really want to press that on vinyl. So, um, I just, I, I still, I didn't have the mix of it, but I had all of the tracks. So I spent, it was sort of like a weird, uh, pandemic idea. Like I wasn't even really talking with a lot of people at that point. I was just kind of, we were doing like having this weird pandemic time. And I just, I, I, I was thinking about Husky Tenor. I was like, I should see what I could do with it. And I just, I tried to respect the decisions that we made when we initially mixed it. Because we always wanted to put on vinyl. Like that was, that was always a thing, but it's just, it's expensive. And at the time we couldn't really swing it. And um, I just tried to respect everything we were doing back then. Because it was a big, that was like a big moment like you know mike and matt and i spent a lot of time on that on that album together um that's a really important memory and i just i didn't want to like i didn't want to like completely i didn't want to make something that sounded like a different album i wanted it to sound exactly like the husky tenor is supposed to sound i wanted it to have every weird sound that's in it every everything that people would think of but i just wanted it to sound as good as it could for vinyl so it was a lot of work I, I, I kind of kept mixing it and then going back to the CD and saying, okay, did, it, did I stray too far from it? Is this, is this right? And then kind of gave it to everybody and got notes on it and just tried to make it so that it was what we all wanted. It, it's weird because it, it's really cool to think about that. Like over the years, we've just had to swallow our attitudes about it and like admit that this seems to be a record some people really care about like really 
like it a lot and that's wonderful and you try to be too cool to think about what other people think about what you do you know but in this case when it came time for that i remember when davis when you brought that up you were like well you know if they want to re-release it i don't have an unmastered version so i might as well just remix it you know and i remember my first thought was like i don't think you should bother i think that it's something that like you know it's a record that Records that you love, you know every you 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 know how it goes. You know, even it just sounds like it sounds. You don't sit around thinking, oh, that harmonica part is too much in the high frequency range. You know what I mean? Like you don't think that when you're listening to what you listen to. You just like you just you just like it and internalize all of it. So I was nervous that it was going to be like I've never heard a remat. I, I think it's pretty rare to hear like a remaster or a remix of something and it's better than it was you know it's, even if it is objectively better it's always going to be subjectively worse because it's not the one that you're attached to so i was kind of like i don't know man don't worry about it you know and being like yeah this is not even a good idea and you're just going to be putting a lot of effort into something that at the end of the day i'm just going to be like mm, no <laughs> you know but um as soon as i heard it i was i loved it i couldn't believe it, it was what we wanted it to be so Took a chance at it, and everybody that I've talked to about it has said that it does sound better. Pretty cool. It wasn't, as Davis said, there wasn't a whole lot of changes to it other than to just, like, sort of clear it up a little bit. And then it was remastered, and he did a nice job with that, too. The Jack, mm -hmm. this guy that remastered it, that was set up through through Adam and, and the label. And um, he did a really good job with it, too. So between... Between that, but and most of the heavy lifting was Davis redoing it. You know, there weren't many notes. It was we were all pretty excited as we got to hear it, and it was cool to hear it again. You know, I don't know about you, Ian, but I don't listen to my own stuff. Do you? <laughs> I'll revisit, revisit it sometimes. So, um, yeah. did you revisit it one way you first listened to it, and what were your thoughts like? It was listening to it again, like critically again. You know, it made me think of when we were doing that in those days, and. When you're making a record, of course, you listen to it obsessively to the point to where like, okay, it's done. That's awesome. I never have to hear this again. <laughs> it's the goal, you know? <laughs> so, but it was kind of that. Yeah, man. It was, it was, it was sort of re, uh, listening to, to it critically. So even, I'm not going to say I hadn't heard it at all in the, you know, 15 years since it came out or whatever, but like, I didn't, um, like pay attention to it. I think we listened to, we would listen to it again. Like, cause we always, this has always been a on again, off again kind of thing with years in between being like actively doing stuff, you know? So it's like, Oh, we're going on tour. What songs should we play? What songs do we, do we, do we just know them all? Or do you just want to, and we'd say, yeah, we know them all. Then we'd get together and be like, we do not know that one. How's it go? <laughs> and we'd listen to it again. <laughs> and so, you know, other than that though, I never really listened to it, but to have to re-listen to it again, like critically and to be like, Oh, I, like, there was nothing that I had never heard before or anything like that because of just how intensely, you know, it was put together in the first place. So I remembered everything that was there. I know everything that's supposed to be there. But it was cool to hear it again and sort of like more objectively to, 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 to be listening for that and appreciate everything that, those, that the, the rest of the players do on it. They're excellent. You're great. And yeah, that's what it really stood out to me more than I think was like, because we, we, at the same time, we're putting together new stuff, you know, and we're like, well, let's make this, I want this new stuff to be like really intricate and to be really like well put together, everything in its right place and just really locked in and on and just really well thought out. That's what we're going to do this time. And then when I heard the Husky Town, I was like, I don't know, we did that then, too, you know, so I was, I, I was uh, pleasantly, you know. Impressed by those guys for sure. And this is me asking from from just a musician standpoint, and me being on label now. How do you like being on C10 compared to your former AF? Well, I mean, you know, C10 was that they put out the re-release. You know, he worked hard to make sure we got it on time. Hooked us up with the mastering. You know, he paid for it. He handled in the mail order. What more could you want? Right. I don't know that it would be, a, I don't, I don't think it would be any different of a process if we were to put a record out with say 10, that's like new stuff, you know, like here's the new record. 
seems like he'd be pretty chill and yeah, put out whatever you give me, which is great. It was not the case with AF, at least moving towards when we thought we were going to work with them on a new record, when we were working with Chris again here. Right, Davis? What was that? Yeah. Was, literally uh, like a day, the day of, oh, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. But uh, it was, he had a lot of, because he also produced it. Chris Barker produced St. Paul. So he had a lot and like wanted to be a part of it. You know, he wasn't just there to hit record. You know, he wanted to be a part of it. So he had ideas. He had suggestions for things. They had um, an idea for the order of things. I mean, we got our way for everything at the end of it, but there were still, and he had a lot of good ideas that we took, you know, but it was collaborative. Whereas with like, um, I don't know that most labels are like that. I think it was just because the producer also was the label guy for St. Paul, you know? And then, and then we were going to work with, with him again. We were starting to work. We were, we were actually starting to work on one song together. Uh, but then everything kind of blew up there with just insane. And, you know, that's that. Or, uh, but we, that was moving towards like, we didn't know if we want, cause we had had such a good time getting together. Just the five of us, me, Matt, Davis, John at Davis's place, putting these new songs together that we were like, Oh, we kind of missed how it was with when we made the Husky dinner, which was just spend as much time as you want all on us, you know, no, nothing else. So I didn't know if we were going to, we weren't sure if we were going to do a next record with AF anyway. Because of that, and I think I was talking to you about that, like at the time when we were, well, it wasn't, weren't you and me talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking you about that, it, like you, you have your guy that you always, what's his name that always records everything for years? I'm um, Derek Shank. Yeah. Yeah. So, he, you know, there should be that kind of a relationship between people that me and Davis have, you know, very, very, very much. And because Davis has recorded everything that the Beagle Club's ever done. Except for St. Paul. And everything, every band I've ever been in has done. It's always been with, with Davis. So we have that kind of thing. Um, and it was hard to let somebody else into it. And uh, that's on me. But it was. It was hard. So. It wasn't a bad idea to try it, though. And, I mean, and I wouldn't have known going into it that it was going to feel that much different. Because, like, honestly, like, doing St. Saint- saint paul with chris like that part was really fun yeah and and like some of those ideas were great and he had ideas for drum fills that i wouldn't have thought of and i mean he didn't tell me exactly what to play but he was just like play a ringo thing here or something like that (laughs) and that was that was really cool but um but it was really weird having it been sent off to somebody else to mix and not being in any like that being pretty removed from that aspect of it because there's there's definitely people that think that's the best sounding one and that's that's totally fine but i feel the least connected to it yeah uh, because... yeah i think we've always been like we we're talking about being that like intricate of every i know every second of the husky tenor and that was something too when i listened to it again critically all these years later for this remaster i knew every second that was on it you know i know every mm-hmm. sound on it because of how much time we spent with it and because of how important every second is to to me to matt to davis the three of us especially you know mm-hmm. cody too but our running joke is was like yeah cody give us all your suggestions man we are happy to ignore them <laughs> well, the origin of that is pretty much because matt and mike and i spent so much time on the husky tenor like and hours then... davis was working at a, at a studio at the time in New Kensington. And when it was closed, it was, he was allowed to just be there. So we would literally be there like from like 10 o'clock at night until his first client got there at like 10 in the morning. You know, we would be there all night putting this stuff together and, and listening to it. So yeah, we spent well, like, weeks, months maybe doing that. <laughs> like Co- Cody rolled in like the last, the last day or the last two days. And we were like, we're way past that. <laughs> like yeah it'd just be like i think maybe that one uh that one symbol hit there's a little too quiet don't you it would be like ship has sailed and it's like, <laughs> that that level of that symbol hit took us six days to get there <laughs> like, 
We're good. <laughs> but yeah, we can be very precious about everything. And uh, that was why it was fun to do that with Chris. It is a great record. It was a great experience. Um, I, I, I loved making it and I loved working with on St. Paul. But when we started making this new stuff together again, it was like, yeah, this is this is how we this is what feels right. You know, so like I said, totally not his. Any of his doing, it wasn't like he's like, you know. Svengalian anything or trying to be, you know, overbearing. It wasn't like that at all. It was it was it's on me. But I just was like, I really didn't know. If. That the if. I really was starting to feel like the record that we wanted to make was going to be one where we just were completely in obsessive control of it, like we were the Husky Tenor. We weren't even like that with We Are Still at War because that was just recorded live. We just set everything up and played it in a big room. And um, we didn't have to be proud. Like, oh, that's what you get, you know? But like, it felt good going back to the, the Husky Tenor way of doing things, I guess, and probably re-listening to those and revisiting those memories, like you said, Davis, that probably informed me of that too. It wasn't yeah. Chris's fault, but we were probably going to end up doing this anyway. Well, As for Satan, what? they just came in because he just said he would like to put Husky Tenor out again. And we had on vinyl for the first time, and we had talked to a bunch of people about that over the years, and the answer was always, eh, it's old, who cares? But this time, it was like, yeah, we haven't put out anything in a long time. Okay, let's do it. One of the things that we did with Husky Tenor that, you know, we, we, we generally try not to rehash the same stuff. Like with each, like every, every album we made a little differently, but with Husky Tenor, we recorded everything in the room, like without any, like everything had to be a real thing. Like we used real piano. If we wanted reverb, we recorded room reverb, but we, we really were low on effects we kind of there's compression and eq but there's not there's no there's no reverb on that album one of the things that has changed a lot since then is electronic instruments have really kind of taken over and they're kind of it's really easy to do things in the box now and like use fake amps and stuff like that but it doesn't feel quite the same or at least for me there's not like the same sense of satisfaction out of like recording something as opposed to like creating it in your computer whenever like we started working on stuff like we i kind of tried using like some fake amps but it really like reminded me oh wait we just need to do this stuff like the husky tenor felt great like it, it feels really 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 good to get those sounds and and to like get a practical thing in the room you know so you, you kind of have to be creative with it sometimes like there was a song that I didn't get. I, I just didn't think I needed drum, like room mics on the drums for, uh, on, um, all points bulletin. And I put it back through some speakers in the studio and mic'd it. Um, did it sound better than if there was a reverb? I have no idea. Right. Uh, but, but it, it was fun though. Yeah. Even all the, in the box stuff will probably, you probably get it to sound better, but again, it's for us, it's, it's that it's the process, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff's fun. We're nerds and we're old men. So we're like, no, put a microphone on any of that. That's how we're going to yeah. do it. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. Going back to you and saying you want things to be different on each album. I know you actually just put out He-Man Skeletor just, just last year right before you guys went to Fest. Yeah. I know you guys work on some new music. So how is the new record going to be different than both? Husky and and St. Paul. I know you guys are going back back to collaborating just with yourself, not with like um Chris Chris Barker, but um how's it gonna be different than than the last two records fooling that is? I think it's gonna be a nice combination of what's worked well before. Um we're going to approach it trying to get all of our live tracks together, which typically we don't do. You know, it you always want it to sound that way, but a lot of times it'll be like drums and a guide guitar, guide vocal, or a guide piano, which is essentially what St. Paul was. And then everything's overdubbed. Um, and then like the extreme of that is we are still at war where like everything, like all 16 people are live. 
uh, but like all of us are going to get together and we're going to do this. We're going to do the tracks live until they feel right. I don't care like necessarily if my plank's perfect on it, but I want it to feel right. I want it to, I wanted to everything to have exactly the right feel to it. And we'll get a vocal on everything and just kind of see what it needs. But, uh, um, we, we kind of have a tendency just to throw a lot of stuff at everything. And I think it's, it's really exciting thinking about just being in a room and making music and trying to capture that. Um, but that's kind of like always been the way I've hoped things would go. And usually there's, there's some, there's something that always stops it. There's either not enough space or there's some, there's some technical reason why you can't, but I, I think we can do it this time and I'm super, super excited to try it. Yeah. And that's, he man of Skeletor was just recorded in Davis's living room and that's exactly how we did it. Everybody was mic'd up at the same time. We played it and then I overdubbed the organ and sang mm-hmm. on it. And that was, and it was done, you know, it, whereas if we would have made that record on St. Paul, Ricky said, it would have been guide track, drums, then put on your guitar, then put on the bass, then put on mats, then put on Johns, then put on the organ, then put on the piano, then mm-hmm. the percussion. Like even the percussion was live. The tambourines were live in the room with E-Man Skeletal in that recording. We thought it turned out great. So those were just demo. We did like six songs that day, five or, or over the course of two weekends, actually. We did like five or six songs, and that was one of them. And we thought they were just demos, but we were like, nah, this one's, that's how it should go. Let's just put it up. Let's just put it out. Have a new song for the best and go with it. So it's not going to be on the record because it's done. It's out. There's no, we're not going to redo it. <laughs> but we play it at every show. Like we played it at every show on tour. So it is one of my faves to do these days. I'm hoping that we can have that kind of like exciting. And like that it feels like we're, we're doing what we're doing. But the, the nice thing is also going to be because there's a lot of, um, you know, we're working on our buddy, John Beard and between him and, and Davis and Cody, who's a, an audio engineer as well. And a live sound guy, Cody is and between them. There's going to be enough isolation between tracks that if somebody screws it up and the other six guys nailed it, well, then we'll just, we can just fix it. So <laughs> some of that too. Beard, Beard has really good taste for the way things sound too. So I feel really good about just like kind of focusing on what I'm doing and focusing on playing the drums and it's going to be great. It's, it's, it's going it's, to, it's going to be really, it's going to be really great. Just kind of, you know, we're kind of approaching it like we do going on tour because like when you're on tour, you're just kind of together the whole time and you gel a little bit better. And, um, I mean, I don't know how this is going to go. I mean, we might, I don't know if we're going to get like, good usable stuff the whole week or if we're just gonna like you know keep doing stuff and then like the last couple days get everything perfect i have no idea but it's gonna be it's gonna be really great just kind of living it that's another thing that we've never really done we've always kind of talked about it but you know at this point never appreciated playing beagle club songs more so it'll be it'll be really great we've rented out the catholic church in Johnstown, an old an old Catholic church, and it has an Airbnb in the like what's that called the rectory or whatever, yeah. you know, like that that the priests live in would live in. And we rented out the whole thing for a week, and we're just gonna like set up camp. There's no noise ordinances or anything because it's in pretty, you know, uh, abandoned part of town there in Johnstown. And and we're just living there for a week. We're just gonna when we come out, let's find out what we got when we come out of it. But we at least know, you know, the songs we want to work on, how we want to get, how we want this to go. But yeah, that's the dream, man. I've always wanted to do that. Just like lock yourself away and just live it instead of working like chipping away at things one weekend at a time for twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> It, it gets so hard to finish those things too, because once you lose your momentum, it just, everything just kind of grinds to a halt and it's like, it just yeah. takes forever. 
St. Paul was incredibly drawn. It was an incredibly long drawn out working on Chris's were... schedule and, and everybody else's and nobody like I was still living in Johnstown, you know? So it'd be like, yeah, I can do from nine in the morning to one in the afternoon on Wednesday. Okay. I'll drive out from jump. <laughs> As Matt would say, nothing rocks before noon. So even when we get together to like write and stuff, we're like, yeah, let's do the whole day. All right, cool. What's the earliest you can be there? And it'll be like noon because nothing rocks before noon. We're not doing anything. Before. Okay, noon it is, you know. <laughs> so it's also kind of worth noting that the version of St. Paul that's out is the fourth time we recorded it. We took a lot of swings at that album and were never happy with it. So that last time was, that was, if it wasn't happening that time, it wasn't happening. But yeah, I mean. Yeah, so we knew it pretty, pretty well going into it, what the parts would be. So that was another thing. Like we weren't bringing these like half formed ideas in with Chris. We had these, we, we brought in these songs that we had already really gone over the same way we go over every songs that we put together. And then, so for, you know, it was a little, it was a bitter pill to hear like, how about try changing this? And it was like, how about where were you four years ago? Well, we made up this part. Like, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like if it should have changed, if it, it should change, somebody would have mentioned it in the three years since we first recorded. Like, no, you know, yeah. so like I said, that's just me being precious. I, I am, I'm sure we're not easy to work with to anybody else but us but no i no, love the way that we do work not. together so ready to do that yeah how, how different were where was the first version of saint paul um than the last version of it, like the final album version not very <laughs> um <laughs> not not very different i don't there's think. there's more like more stops more fills and sure you know th th it feels like there there were a lot of like little changes like that uh, but it was, it was pretty similar uh there was th there's a version of winter in westmont where matt's keyboard part is the loudest thing in the whole and it just takes over and it's like it's so good I, I that's the only the only thing i really miss from like the demos to the final is how loud that keyboard was oh yeah uh, to be clear it was it's all the the uh, the record version, the final version, is all better than anything we did. Oh, it. for sure, for sure. And it was, yeah, it was little stuff like, um, like you said, just kind of tightening up parts, arrangements, yeah. and things like that. We had a pretty good idea, and I think he wanted to respect that too. Um, and he did, you know, and just took what we had already done and like, okay, let's make a better. Well, how can we make this more of what you're going for? You know. Well, As opposed yeah. to like if bringing in a half formed idea to him or him just being like, okay, why don't you try it like this this time for this song? It's like, I don't. Well, the other thing too play is well like, with others. I'm a jerk. You know, with, with us doing it so many times before, we were pretty frustrated with it. And he was very excited about it. Same part. Um, which, yeah, which was yeah. really cool. Um, yeah. Because like, you know, there, I can't remember what the part was, but like he was so excited, he kicked he kicked a heater over. He kicked over the heater. That was I was just gonna say that that is my most that's the um that's the strongest memory I have of that entire process. Yeah, you know what it was? It was that drum fill before the last chorus of um in like a lion. Yeah, like, do and he was like, just try it. It's gonna be cool. Or like you want a drum solo there, dude? And he's like, no, I don't drum solo. Just stop, and then a sweet fill. We're like, mm. and he was like, just try it. Just try it for me. Maybe it's cool. Maybe it's cool. And then Dave was like, okay. And he, he was recording it and he tried it. And Chris just went, you yeah. already just kicked over us. <laughs> we were like, okay, that's staying. Right. He was like, don't like it. The space heater kicking drum fill has to stay forever. Yeah. But he was, he was great. He kept their spirits up. He only one time was like, hey, let me talk to you for a second. It's just to me. And he was like, I'm going to need you to kind of rope some of these guys in, okay? Keep them a little focused. 
keep things moving. But I don't want to be the guy to do that. But uh, you probably can, right? So yeah, let's maybe let's maybe make a little more use of our time instead of you know, I don't know, screwing around, whatever we were <laughs> playing with their yeah. pedals. Let's yeah. get to the find out part of the fuck around and find out. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas we're like, no, that's very much part of the process. How about it, Davis? It's like, oh, I'll try this. I'll, you know, especially when yeah. when recording. So, yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, he's a, you know, I love him. I do. And, and it's the worst. Just the worst. You know, they like, oh, how that went down. Just insane. And what happened to those women? And it's, it's the worst. It's really, hurts. you know, everybody. Uh, this, it just it was a real betrayal, you know, to, yeah. to, to so many people who got into radical politics including feminism, including, you know, that sort of thing, who got into those kind of politics because of anti-flag. That wasn't us, you know, we're a little, I don't know, they weren't that to us, to me, to anybody in, in our band. Like we never really, we got hooked up with them because Derek, was on that label, you know, and we knew Stell because Stell lived in Johnstown for a little while too. So like he knew us and we got back to doing, playing music again. It was like, you know, six years between we were still at war and starting to write the St. Paul stuff. You know, when we started playing shows again together, Stell came to one of the shows and was like, hey, I want to put a record out. Yeah. Okay. You know, so it didn't have anything, we didn't have any kind of personal whatever to anti-flag as an yeah. entity but so many people did and it just was that was i don't know makes you think the whole thing's bullshit yeah well, you, you know rock is bullshit it probably is you know it's not a safe thing it's not a it doesn't i do like having like it's important to me to like identify with a sort of do this still uh, today to, to identify with punk rock is like a movement it's like a vehicle for radical change and that might uh, every step misstep that inches me closer to thinking that that's just naive you know this is a pretty good punch to the stomach you know there are not yeah. them about me you know what i mean it's but it, i when there were people who were literally really hurt and very, very, very hurt by that man. That was one thing with me when it came to that. Well, well, when I first heard about that, I thought about, I was involved on the victims and everything too. We got that. It was heartbreaking to see. And they, it didn't, like you were saying too, it didn't really affect, like, it didn't really like affect just the fan base. It affected a lot, just punk in general, because, because they're very prone to to speak out about that. When this happens, it, it um, it, it looks bad for for both the other members who probably didn't know what what was going on, but and and alongside the fact that their close friend, it was uh, which is out as a piece of shit and lied to them just to, and used this band to to his advantage for his career. And I thought and that immediately thought about you, and the Beal Club man like Rebuilder, Sammy K, Snodgrass, and everybody who was signed to AF that all madly everything that they were planning on putting out is just gone completely, like. Rebuild was putting out a new record. I think Pity Party was putting out something too through AF. Then that that then that ceased. So, well, I will say that I think that Chris Stowe handled it the way I I like. I got nothing for respect, but respect for the way that Stowe handled it. And that was he just immediately shut it down. He was like, "It's just done." Any res any remaining um records that they still had from any band. They just gave it to them. There you go. Sell it. Throw in a pile. Do whatever you want with it. You don't owe us for it. You don't owe anything. And that included Rebuilders, which was done. Their album was done, but not released. And when Ste when Stel and the Barker, I guess, I, I don't know the exacts of it, but certainly Stel had that made part, who was in on that decision. I don't know if it was just his, but Either way, he was the one that had to handle it. 
And when Stokey just gave them their album, they just got a free album. Uh, you know, he tried to make it right with those bands, but I know that the homeless gospel choir stuff that was on there, you know, Matt was in the homeless gospel choir and they put out the, uh, the last record that the homeless gospel put out with, with AF was, um, this lands your landfill, you know, and Matt wrote like half of it. He was like in it, in it on, on yeah. those last two albums. He's yeah. not in it and we quit the homeless gospel choir, but he was in it. Those last two records, they had a bunch to get back in, uh, that Stell gave them back. Whereas like St. Paul was gone. It was out of print by the time this happened. We didn't, I think he found like half a box with like five records in it. And he even gave me those, you know, um, you know, but we didn't sell them. We just kind of, there's something to that. You know what I mean? We, yeah. we did sell them, but we gave it to the, the, um, the victim center in Johnston on the money. So, cause there's just something about it. So I don't know what, I guess maybe that's why we put it out with something else. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe, uh, yeah. So it did throw, throw a lot of people for a loop, I guess, that were counting on something like that. I had a record coming. I remember Sammy was like, yeah, this was just the last straw for me. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I quit. I hate it. I'm done. You know, but then I saw him at Fest. He's still out there. But that's, I mean, like, everybody had that kind of, like, I think a lot of people felt like a real sense of, like, honest, like, like I said, betrayal, you know? And this is so common with, you know, men in show business, <laughs> right? You're hearing about some creep every five seconds you know men in general men in general absolutely they don't get the pout on press that a celebrity does um they should but they don't you know but um they that there's a that one with with justin seemed to be more that there was betrayal there wasn't i didn't see too much online about people like leering about i always knew that guy was a you know what i mean there wasn't a whole lot of that like like when Marilyn Manson, you know what I mean? Or like people that like smile and want to see somebody go down, even if they deserve it, you know, but in this like selfish, gross kind of way. I don't see that much with Justin. I think people were really genuinely betrayed. I do want to say that. I, I feel like when I, I talked about it before, I feel like it opened up a conversation about what does allyship and activism actually, actually, actually look like in music? Because I feel like that's a very important thing to talk to talk about. Like if you and and what and are you, if and if what you're saying about are you matching your actions to that as well? And I do I do feel like when when you are a are a political band, find yourself as a political band. If you fuck up once, then you're you're just done because the show because I feel like it will show that you're against every, most some things that, that you that you preach about. That was a very heavy subject. I think and, that they should, I think that you should be held to a higher standard if that's what you think you're about. Because look yeah. at what it does, you know what I mean? I mean? But I also think that I don't have any interest in somebody who doesn't, and this is music or in general. I don't want any part of somebody that doesn't mean what they say. I guess what what I what I was saying was when you when you mark yourself as this very hyper political person, and then you do and then you do something. Something comes out about you. Something comes out that's fucked up. That's not magnified because of how you, how you've been how you've been presenting yourself. I mean, that's pretty common in radical circles. Yeah. yeah, predators and people that think they're above that, or I don't know what it is, man. I don't know what to say about allyship and what its place is. It should be uh, a lot more of a given than it is. Yeah. What else is all? <laughs> that, that was very heavy so now we're going to get into a very fun game called okay surprise motherfucker what's it called surprise motherfucker all right this, this is me and we will be, we'll be asking you some some random questions and getting your response yeah, I'm going to kick um, it off. One of the things that uh, we typically do is we like to play Mount Rushmore with people and since Everyone here but Ian is a Western Pennsylvania boy to some extent. Uh, you're Mount Rushmore of Western Pennsylvania music venues. 
I will put Mr. Roboto Project on it. It was our first home away from home here in Pittsburgh. That sort of felt so like things were going well. I will put, I'll put the 315 Beware Punk House in Johnstown, Pennsylvania as the most prominent of the four. Um, it was literally just a gutted house. Uh, we knocked down the walls so that this, and it was like, there was a step down into the next, part. <laughs> it was like into the next apartment because it's knocked on the walls to connect to apartment. There was a step down and the bands played lower than the crowd. And it was just like, yeah, it was great. It was just a, an empty house. Some of the best. We never got to play there, but that was with, uh, you know, our, our teenage punk bands, really formative years. I guess I got to put, um, you know, the, the, probably the Alton Community Center in Johnstown on there for the same reasons. It's those formative years. And finally, I'll say, I'll say, these are just Western Pennsylvania ones. Okay. I will also say that I like to, I don't know. I like Club Cafe. I'll put Club Cafe on there. But no, you know what I got to do? I got to put Club Log on there. We never got to play there, but I mean, that's, you know, everybody went to Club Log. That was a big deal. So it's got to be on there. What about you, Davis? So I was initially only thinking about places that we had played. Um, and the only the only difference I would make from Mike's list is where he put Club Log, I would put 709 Railroad Street. Well, um, you know. That was but a if, town venue too. But if we're going just like venues where we've seen shows, I would go uh, Metropole. Uh, saw my favorite They Might Be Giants show there ever. Uh, uh, Rosebud, which was uh, uh, right next to Metropole. Uh, um, Club Laga. And now there's only three venues. There's, there's those three. <laughs> Starlight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I had one uh, rougher for Mike and um, because you and I we talked about this artist and for a club cafe show just recently. Well, what's your about rough word of Springsteen albums? Of Springsteen albums? Yes. Ooh. Um, no, nah, that's probably. Do you think you think that's the well, the first one? Greetings from Asbury Park is on. Born to Run is on there. Mm -hmm. Nebraska's on there. Darkness on the Edge Down. Yeah. That's my four. Just because those are my favorite four. My, my favorite one is Born to Run. But I would agree with the all the choices. Like those are those are those are the same four I would pick. There's some strong contenders. Born in the USA. You know, I like the rising. Part. I think the rising's a great album. But it doesn't yeah. have any of those four. No. <laughs> Which is pretty no. good. To have a record as good as The Rising and be like, yeah, but it's not one of his best. E, e, e Street Shuffle is really good. Yeah. And uh, like, honestly, E Street Shuffle is probably like, it's pro it's a really good bridge between Asbury Park and Born to Run. There's so much energy. The drummer that they that he has on the first two albums is so good. Like as good as Max Weinberg is, like Max Weinberg's playing on Born to Run isn't like the height of where like he he gets a lot better as time goes on. His drummer on the first two albums is just wild. He's so good. But but I I, I love those albums. What are your guilty music pleasures? Uh, hey, jealousy. Uh, my wife is not happy that I like that song so much. Dude, that's a great song. I put it on all the time, and she's like, come on. If you haven't listened to the episode of 60 Songs That Explain the 90s about that song. Mm. I had a really bad experience last week where, like, I, I was I was treated to a professional shave, like, like, like the straight razor and everything, which I've never done. I I'm usually look like a slob. But I went in. And I was the only guy in there and there was this channel playing like 
he's playing music videos and it was like this 90s channel and at first like the first couple songs were like 90 songs I wouldn't necessarily put on, but I didn't hate them. And then I remembered how bad a lot of the nineties were. <laughs> it was just unbearable. Cause it's like all stuff that like I would immediately turn off if given the opportunity, but I had to listen to all like the songs all the way through with a and literal blade to your throat with a blade to my throat in the, and he was kind of like new. He just opened his shop mm -hmm. like a few months ago. So like it took a long time. So I had a lot, a lot of time to think about a lot of songs that were really, like really I could, bad. I could die. And the last thing I'm going to hear is, you know, uh, Groove is in, not Groove is in the Heart. That's an 80s song, right? No, it's a 92. It, 90. Was, it was unreal. It was, yeah. No, well. Nine months, that's what songs annoyed you the most that you, that you heard? Um, uh, I got the music, or you got the music, it, like whatever the the oh. new radicals get what you yeah. get. Yeah. Nope. Dude, I'm we sorry. Said, we were talking about the Yeah. We were talking about Joe where we started uh, lived on Beagle Club Road. He yeah. wanted them said that's like that song came on and <laughs> he was like this is the song that's playing over the loudspeakers in hell. <laughs> I, I believe that. I think that's probably It's a very bad song. Just trash. <laughs> Yeah. No redeeming qualities to that song. <laughs> no. And there's, it's funny too, because like until recently, I've been really bad about finding new music. Like a lot of, a lot of my music that's after the 90s is from bands that I've always liked or from earlier bands, you know, just not a lot of new stuff until like the last year. Um, I've had a lot of that. And, it was just really eye opening to see how bad the nineties actually were. I was, <laughs> I was there, you know, but I don't know. I mean, I, I love 90s hip hop. Sure. Yeah. Why not? But, but not uh, all of it. There was, there was no nineties hip hop in this mix. It was no. like, hmm. wrong kind of barbershop. Like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For mammies, overrated or underrated? It depends. Uh, the original for is very good. Um, I mean, you have to want you have to want French fries on your sandwich. It's pretty greasy, but it can also be very, very great. Um, the permanies near where I live, uh, not very good. Uh, they. I feel like the person that makes the sandwiches there is uh, not qualified to, to, to make sandwiches. Um, you know, usually you have to like rebuild it. But the, the Primanis by the Pittsburgh airport is wonderful. So if you're by the Pittsburgh airport, it is, it is something. If you're in the strip district, there's better choices. My you know, answer is that it is proper. It's properly rated. It's neither under nor over. Are either of you guys still facing sadness about the closing of the O in Oakland? Like um, I am. So no. The last time we were there, at the bottom of the stairs leading down to um to the bathrooms. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A huge pile of human shit. <laughs> so no, I'll I say... wasn't too sad. I was just like, mm, I'm never going there again anyway. And so you know. It closed a couple of years later and I was like, yeah, good. What I'll, what I'll say is I've always known about the human shit downstairs. Um, and I was still sad about it. Um, <laughs> you know, I just know not to go downstairs. Yeah, I guess you're right. You know, um, the, 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 the weirdest <laughs> thing about the O was having to have a team of people to like get your stuff because everything was in different stations. So like, somebody on fries if somebody you know you have to have like three or four people to get your food but and, at least uh, they were qualified they were qualified and uh the uh the cigarette machine was prime real estate if you're trying to eat in uh, that was that was a surface um but uh yeah no i miss it i think they had the best fries in the world and to this day i've never had one better and 
they also had the most ridiculous portions, which, you know, I mean, there's like ridiculous portions, but like they'd have like a little, like this was a lo- like a little container on the wall that like said, this is a large. And what they would do is they would take the fryer, they would put that on top of the pr- pile of fries and then dump it over. And then you couldn't see it and it would just be a mound of fries. So yeah, it's, ridiculous. it's, it, it's a sad day. I think we also need to kidnap Ian and bring him up to Johnstown to take him to Coney Island to get a sundowner. Um, yeah. What, 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 what is a sundowner? This this sounds vaguely racist. I I don't know how I feel about this. (laughs) Well, I wonder if it is. What do you say? It's a hamburger with an egg on it. It And mustard and chili. Chili and and onions. And onions. I always thought the the sundowner part um, referred to the egg, but now I'm, you know, knowing where it comes from, it could be racist. <laughs> I'm a little, hmm. So like back in back in 2008, um, like whenever Obama ran for the first time, there was three weeks where like between one primary and the Pennsylvania primary. And it was just three weeks of media coverage on Pennsylvania. And they spent time in Johnstown and it was like in the worst places, like just people saying the worst stuff and people at Coney Island. And it was, it was, it was a rough, it it made made, made, made us, made us look horrible. Just, I mean, I I mean, it's fair. I mean, there's people there that said those things, but I mean, including Cody. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I remember that now. It's it's under so, so the at that point in time, so this is something about Coney Island. It was owned it was owned by the same family for years. It closed down and has since reopened. But they used to um when they were making hot dogs, they would line them up on their arm. So like bare flesh. Bare flesh. Just line line up hot dogs on their arm. So like that was the sequel ingredient. Yeah, it's like the arm sweat. It was so gross. There, there, there's a there's a place here called on Curtis County on the Wieners. And mm-hmm. the guy who owns it, Gino, it's been around in Cumberland for like I think over hundred years now. He does the same thing. There you oh. go. You gotta come. That's old go. school. Yeah, I, I it sounds I'm like you don't need to come to our Coney Island. You have your own right there. Yeah, we we have to go to his. Yeah. <laughs> but still do but the I, own thing. That's great. And I need to get I need to get a sundowner and I also eat I still need to get El Tuna pizza as well. Are they known for pizza? So the Al Tuna pizza, it actually became an internet meme. I forget where it originated, but a bunch of places do it now. But it's the worst pizza in the universe. Like is if, if anyone wants to listen and be like, no, no, I promise you St. Louis pizza is worse. Like, no, you're wrong. Al Tuna pizza is basically a Sicilian slice of pizza mm-hmm. with sauce. Yellow American cheese, sausage, and green peppers. What? what? Okay. Oh, man. <laughs> That's about how we feel about it. It looks like it. the kind of thing that turns turtles into martial arts stars. <laughs> well, then I'm going, but it doesn't sound good, but if it, you know. It's a you have to eat it once. Okay. So where, where in Altoona is it? Oh, all of, you, you'd have to look it up. Uh, we tried to go to the one when I was driving Ian back, and uh, it's online said it was open, and it was not open New Year's it, Day. So, is it called? Is it called Altoona Pizza? That's the style. Yeah, the style. I it's mean, that's style. not the, name of the restaurant. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You would. You uh, would so order multiple, an multiple pizza. bars and restaurants serve this so, monstrosity. So there's like New York, Chicago, and Altoona. Yeah. All right. I, I love it. Oh. <laughs> I guess one more one more question. So we wrap um wrap this up. Who do you want to who do you want to see to be a cult tour with um in the future? Like who who was on your wish list, your bucket list? You and make it happen. All right. Yeah. Just that just you, Ian. You're the yeah, only one. No, I'm 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 honored. Yeah, no, that'd be cool. Um anybody whose music you want to hear every day. Because you know you end up hearing a lot of the same songs a lot, and that would be fun. We're doing a couple I... dates with our buddy Schaefer James in April. We've been threatening to try to get something together with 
Blind Adam in the Federal League. Their album so much. Like that, that their their new album is great. Yeah. Yeah, and just yeah, we, we just toured with Mara Weaver. It's best to tour with your friends. That was friend. that was really fun. It's best to tour with your friends. I want to tour with you, Mike. You're <laughs> my friend. And then uh so so you said you have some dates coming up in April. What else is on the uh docket for you guys? Oh uh, this this record when uh, we're starting at the what's the date, Davis? Twenty sixth, March twenty sixth. Yeah, it sounds right. Well, we're going to make the record. So that's the big focus right now. We got a couple of shows here and there, a couple like festival things to do here and there around them. But that's what we're really excited about. After that's done, I'm sure we'll do another one. Hope to do another one in the fall when the record's done. Another big tour, but yeah. yeah. This last tour we did was the first one we'd done in years and years. And it was the best one we've ever Going on, I think so. Yeah, actually, let me ask I'm, you about that. You guys kind of went all over Appalachia, as it were. Towns that you really liked playing in, like maybe, I don't know, that you hadn't played before or that you hadn't played in a while? I was surprised by how good D.C. was. It had been a while since we were there, and even then it was, we haven't played there very often, but it was a really good show. Um, I, I, I liked, we played the Fest, and that was awesome. That was a bucket list thing. You know, we played in Gainesville before, but never during the Fest, so. That was super cool. They were all, uh, Atlanta was great. They were all really cool because it had been a while. And there's this sense of like, I don't know if I have the stomach to, you know, slug it out and play to zero people when I'm all excited about actually doing this again. They're like, yeah, nobody's going to care. Did anybody care in the first place? But they were all really good shows. People came out and they made us feel, we were greeted as liberators. <laughs> Richmond was really fun. Yeah, Richmond was great. Yeah, they, they were all good. They were all they were all pretty good. How's the Johnstown show? Yes, just knowing about you, you're, you're going back to where you're recording this. Ever played a sold out show there? Unbelievable. It was yeah, that was a big deal. That was really cool. I didn't think anybody would come, and and I I don't mean that in a like I really didn't. I kind of felt like the scene had left. Uh, there's only a few people that I know of that are still here that would go to a show, and honestly. It was sold out before a lot of people could get tickets for it. So I was really, really surprised. People traveled for it. It was really, it was really cool. Uh, my kids were there. My, my, like, there's a clip online of us playing um, the Outlaw Trail. And like Mike's, Mike's kid is in it. My, my daughter was in it. It, it was unreal. It was so much fun. Yeah, it was a full circle thing, man. You know, you want to feel good in your hometown. So that could have went one of two ways. <laughs> only. <laughs> that could have only went one of two ways. And luckily right, it, it went the good, good, good way. Yeah. It went the good way. That's good. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> that would have been soul shattering. <laughs> that turned out the way I thought it was. <laughs> and we set it up ourselves and everything you know what i mean we were just like okay we're just gonna we're just gonna do this and uh it, cody set it up mostly and he was working with the venue our buddy micah that, that runs it and stuff and he was like i think you need to do print sales you know we we're like come on now but yeah glad we did apparently, apparently we did oh my god yeah, mike davis it's a pleasure to have, have you guys on here my, you remain one of my favorite artists that I've met in the last few years. I, I truly mean that. Thanks, your, man. Your writing ability, your, your lyricism, I, I love it all. I hate personality and everything. Well, I'm really glad we got to be pals, you and me. Thanks for asking us to do this. Of course. Good Davis, to meet you, you're, man. Davis, you're now my favorite, favorite people club member. Don't tell Cody. Oh, wow. Uh, he knows. Cody knows. It's <laughs> Deep down, he knows it's not him. Is all I've. <laughs> I think that's 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 fair. But th thank you, thank you. <laughs> I don't even know what that meant, but you know, I'm... any chance to uh, say something about our boy, we'll take it. Love him so much, Cody Wallet. He's one of a kind. You guys need to have him on on your show. You you need to ask him. You could spend a whole show asking what his favorite fill in the blank is he is 
he yeah, has we, a favorite. He has a favorite everything, and it's really fun. <laughs> that so with your surprise game, if you could say, okay, favorite river, you you couldn't stump him. He's got an answer. Cody, favorite river, Snake River in Montana. <laughs> favorite shark, Hammerhead. Answers it like, was there another answer? Yeah, it's great. Favorite, favorite everything. And we got to do that now. Cold. All right. We'll make Put it happen. <laughs> Hours of fun. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, thanks I, for having us, guys. Of course. I'm excited. Well, first, I'm excited to have you guys back at Fox and Friends, like the festival this year. This show is the brainchild of Black Guy Fox, folk punk Rio. You can find him on all the social medias as Black Guy Fox or Black Guy Fox Music, as well as on his website, blackguyfox.com. The intro and outro are both from the song New American Meltdown by Black Guy Fox, so that's legally covered because this is his podcast, and that is his song available on the album Life, Love, and the Bomb. Additional music elements provided by Fab Shop Music a royalty-free music subscription service for podcast hosts and YouTube creators. More info at fabshopmusic.com. Sound design and editing by Ed Cunard, who appears courtesy of his dog and many, many cats. Cover art by Jacob Matthews, a pal who has been down since day one. Fox and Friends is hosted on Spotify for podcasters. Listen on Spotify for the best experience, Finally, while Fox and Friends firmly believes that punk rock is and should be a safe space, we know it can't be safe for everyone without excluding bad elements. So remember, remember. So tell your local Nazis and your fascists to fuck off. He's Black Guy Fox, and I'm, uh, who, who am I when I'm by myself? I am having an existential crisis. Oh, no. Um... He's Black Guy Fox, and I'm not. No. Ugh. He, no. Fuck. Like.